Hello and welcome to Sports Talk Philadelphia Online. I'm your host, Josh Abrams, and with me today is my normal panelist, Gia Lancey, and our director, Tyler Pittis. Uh, we are going to talk about the Eagles draft as the draft is just around the corner. And if we have some time at the end, we'll discuss the MLB contingency plan and their plans for realigning for a potential season. Um, so I guess we'll start with the the draft, the NFL draft right around the corner, as I said. Uh, the Eagles have the 21st overall pick in the first round. Uh, I guess is a good way to start is by getting your guys' opinion on what you think they should address the most. Uh, what do you want the Eagles to do at 21? Or if you want them to trade up, trade down. Like, what, what are you guys thinking? Um, I think that trading up is ideal. I think that wide receiver is obviously something we need to get for Carson Wentz. Um, and I think that there's definitely some pretty good contenders if we trade up. I think if we don't trade up, um, there's like some potential, but I'm not sure if that's what their best option is right now. Yeah, I mean, I think – I think that this draft is so deep at so many different positions that staying right where they are is, is perfectly fine with me. I, I would be fine if they did that, um, especially at the positions they need, which are wide receiver. Um, I still think they need to draft a cornerback, but that's not obviously as pressing now with Darius Slay. Um, but those are two extremely deep positions right now. So, you know, even if they go another direction in the first round, they can still get perhaps a quality uh, wide receiver in the second round. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in agreement with you guys on the on the receiver need. Uh, I'm reading an article right now that says that there there's a possibility that the Eagles could trade up and pursue C.D. Lamb from Oklahoma. Now, I think I think Lamb is probably the the best overall receiver in the draft. He's not the tallest because there's Justin Jefferson from uh, from LSU, and he may not be the fastest. Uh, because there's T. Higgins and the and the duo of Henry Ruggs, and um, and who's the other guy from Alabama? Uh, um, I uh, blanking. Henry Henry Ruggs. Oh, and Jerry Judy. Oh, Jerry Judy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jerry Judy, the <laughs> other guy. <laughs> well, well, that's, think, a, that's that's go ahead, Jim. Sorry, I think as of right now, like Howie Roseman, I was reading he's like in love with um, C. D. Lamb, so I think yeah. that that's what they're going to wind up doing. Um, you know, it's the Howie show over there, so I'm not – Right. And Judy is so good, but I don't think anyone anticipates that the Eagles are going to be able to either trade up to get him or, um, you know, him falling. I think too many teams are in love with him to to pass on him. Well, that's that, – I think that would be fine with me because I was watching some of C.D. Lamb's highlights this morning once I came across that article, and he's the highest-graded receiver on NFL.com right now. Um the way, I don't know how exactly they grade it, but the way they label the grades is that they would have him as a, as a contributing starter year one. And I think with the Eagles situation, you know, we're not going to – at this it, – it's false hope if you're depending on, on Alshon Jeffrey and Deshaun Jackson to be there for the majority of the season. Right. Uh, the, but I think, I think you can't count them out um, – well, Deshaun Jackson at least – for um, like being a good mentor for – somebody that we're getting so but I yeah injury wise I don't know yeah it's tough so I mean I think addressing the receiver at 21 is going to be very important but it's also a matter of what order the draft goes in because it's so unpredictable all these mock drafts we see are just no matter who makes them no matter if it's Mel Kuyper or if it's or if it's us you know it's it's going to be inaccurate because of the way it goes um so it's just going to be interesting because anything can happen on draft day. Well, and this draft is so different from every other draft for the last 50 years. I mean, this teams have had way less time to meet with players in person and get a feel for them. So I think it's more important to get the guy that, you know, you feel comfortable with rather than potentially reaching for a superstar. You know, you mentioned how he really liked CD lamb. Well, if he goes off the board, don't just, try to rush and get another receiver. You know, if you, if you like Kenneth Murray at linebacker, you know, he might not be an absolute superstar, but he'll be a very solid linebacker in the league for years. You know, get him. Don't, yeah. don't try to, don't try to, you know, reach for, for someone that's boom or bust. Right. I also, and I think that even if we're 21st pick, 
I think that um, LSU's Justin Jefferson is a good potential for the Eagles. Um, I mean, he was Joe Burrow's favorite guy last year, and he had he had a pretty big season last year. So I think that he is somebody that you know Carson Wentz could definitely adjust to. I agree. Yeah, what, I, I like what him. Help, what helps with those two receivers in particular, with Justin Jefferson and uh, and Ceedee Lamb, is that they performed in the big in what's you know not the biggest stage of college football because that was LSU and Clemson, but Jefferson had had a stellar game. I think it was either the semifinal or the championship game. He had those four touchdowns in the first half. Uh, C.D. Lamb was was Jalen Hurts' favorite target all of last year, and he was a big reason why they won the Big 12 championship. So when they come up big in, in games like that, that's the reason why they're graded so high. I think it's going to depend on how the first those first four receivers pan out. If they're off the board by the time we it, we, it comes to our pick, that's going to play a big – factor in what Howie decides to do I think yeah yeah I mean definitely like they could go defense as well though I mean Howie Roseman likes to do that maybe not in the first round but in the later rounds you know that's definitely something he loves to do and has benefited us so I mean I wouldn't be surprised if it was something like that as well yeah I mean like I said before I think Kenneth Murray is a really solid safe pick um we've been working with very mediocre linebackers for the last who knows how long, and they've been playing well. I mean, Nigel Bradham has been extremely reliable. Um, you know, they're, they're playing decently with not that, you know, much talent. So if we do get a guy that is coming in with a lot of, of, you know, sheer talent, it'd be interesting to me to see what they could do with him. Yeah. I think it'll be interesting to, if, if they do go defense with the, with that 21st pick, does the C.J. Henderson from Florida fall down? Probably not because he's the second highest graded cornerback in the draft right now. But we, you know, picking up Jeff Gladney from TCU wouldn't be a wouldn't be the worst pick. Or, or right below him on, on the grading scale is Trayvon Diggs, Stephon Diggs' little brother. Um, I think any 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 of those kind of picks where you're looking at receiver, cornerback. Or if you want to go on the line and, and, and pick a, a D tack or an edge rusher, which I think would be more preferred. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of options. And, and with the draft being so talented, I think it's going to be hard for Howie to miss out on a pick. <laughs> for with the, or at least with the first pick. Yeah, I agree. Um, like I said, this is the deepest draft that we have seen in a very long time. Um, it's going to be interesting. Obviously, Howie does not like to go flashy in the first round. We've seen that. No one expected him to pick Derek Barnett a couple years ago. No one expected him to pick Andre Dillard. Um, so who knows? I mean, it's it's totally unpredictable at this point. Yeah. I mean, I do think he's going to go C.D. Lamb, but I guess it really depends on what's going to happen before it gets to us. Yeah, and like, and like I said before, the, 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 for, the foursome of Jefferson – Judy and Ruggs and, and Lamb, that's going to play a big, big part in what we do with 21 because if there could be a possibility where the four of them are taken in the top 10, which would be insane. But again, anything's possible. Um, they could, they could stretch, they could stretch all the way to right before us and then how he's really put under pressure. I mean, um, you know, the uncertainty factor is just so looming that you, you don't know, you don't know what, what options there, uh, there will be, but it seems like there's a wide yeah. variety of them. It's also really hard because, like, they can't – they're not in the same room as other general managers, coaches, and stuff. So, it's – like, I think they have 10 minutes between each pick, right? Uh, yeah, I'm not... Yes, for the first round. I don't know if anything's changed, though. I, I, I – you know, it could have changed because of this. I have no idea. No, I think it's – I think it's still 10 minutes. But, like, that's not a lot of time. What if there's technical difficulties? Like, I think they have, like, a backup phone. But – there's a lot of people you'd have to call in between, especially if it came down to like right before us and they have to change something that, you know, it's, it's hard. So I, there, it's definitely going to be interesting to play, to see play out. Yeah. It's very fitting because of, you know, like Tyler said, this is a, this, we haven't seen a draft like this with this many uh, high ceiling potential prospects in, in a very long time. And it just so happens to occur the same year that a, an unprecedented 
pandemic hit. So it's like yeah. everything's online, everything's changed. Uh, and it's, it's, it's fitting because of how historic it is on the two sides, but it, but it does add a burden to it. Yeah, uh, obviously. I mean, is there anybody that you guys think um, we should have attempted to get before the draft? Oh yeah, I guess free agency would be a good topic. I mean. Because they really didn't make any moves offensively. No, they didn't. I, I, I will say that I was calling for, I was calling for Howie's, you know, for Howie's head because he didn't do any he didn't do anything really until he traded for Darius Slay. And that was kind of the saving grace because right. the last three, I mean he's just a give him time. Will you let him I know? <laughs> I know. Well, I know there's still time, but it's like wide receiver had to be the most pressing issue given the given the our receivers at the end of last year and i mean the, he did bring in Darius Slay which i will give him all credit for and Slay is a fringe top 5 corner and the ranking doesn't really matter because he's an island quarterback or cornerback he can you know you put him on the best receiver on any team we play next year and then we'll worry about the rest like that was a big that was a big move for me but he still has to figure out something with the offense because i mean it's nice that we have two targets, two tight end, two solid tight end targets, but we got to get a burner, someone at least a healthy burner. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. that's why I think in the draft he's totally going to go offensive. I, I mean, I think that he usually does more of a defensive draft, but I know, like, that's just been the team the past few years too. But, like, I think he'll go later rounds for defense and pick up somebody good because I think that he's good at that. But that's why I'm really thinking C.D. Lamb for – first pick there is a lot that concerns me on the offensive side of the ball I mean you know with with Nelson Aguilar leaving uh you know it's sounding like they're not going to keep Alshon Jeffrey around because of you know everything that's happened um and Deshaun Jackson who knows how many games he's going to play so we really don't have any surefire 16 game I mean it's always impossible to say that a player's going to play for 16 games but a surefire you know receiver so we might need to draft a couple of receivers, you know, and in that point, it's a very young receiver room. Uh, Jason Peters, you know, leaves an open spot at, at offensive tackle. So we have a lot to address on the offensive side of the ball um, that I don't, I don't really know where those things are going to come from at this point. I was going to say, do you think it's at this point, it's better to address those offensive needs in the draft or can we, can we bail ourselves out a little bit in free agency still? For wide receiver, I would definitely say the draft. You don't need to pay a wide receiver on the free agent market this year um, just because the draft is so deep. Um, but for offensive line, who knows? <laughs> you know, I, I, you know I, who knows where, where that's going to come from? Yeah, and I mean, like you were talking about earlier, how you didn't think how he, made, how he was making any moves and then – he made a big move. I mean, I think that he's just like, you got to sit and wait and see what happens. And I mean, I think, I think he'll come through, but I I don't, I agree with Tyler. I don't think it's going to be, we're going to be finding any alignment in the draft, but maybe. Well, there's, I think it's interesting. There were rumors that uh, the Vikings were going to trade for Odell Beckham. uh, And obviously that would be groundbreaking in Philadelphia. That would be absolutely insane. Um, but it does leave open the possibility of, of trading for a receiver. We have four fourth round picks. Um, you know, we don't just have to look at, at free, uh, free agent wide receivers. You know, there's going to be a lot of teams that are trying to trade up. Uh, maybe someone, you know, wants one of those f- four top receivers left and, and there's only, you know, the three taken off the board or whatever. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see, you know, what he does with trades as well. If if we were to address the offensive line, let's say, because I know with with Peters now in free agency, we have that tackle spot open. Um, do you think they address that that tackle spot, or do they address the other guard spot? Because I don't know what the deal is with that with who's going to be on the other side of Brandon Brooks. I think I think it, both both positions are in extreme need right now. I'm not sure that Dillard is ready to to take that starting spot. Uh, Vitai left too, 
So I don't know what they're expecting at that left tackle spot. There's no chance that Lane Johnson is going to move over there the way that he is playing at right tackle and the way that he has always played at right tackle. Um, so I, I think that is a, a position that no one is really talking about that the Eagles desperately need. I think – I feel like that they're kind of starting fresh and, like, you know, they got rid of so many older people. And I think that maybe they're looking for someone young. It's kind of hard to tell. But I, I hope that they get somebody young that they can mentor into that position and, you know, that some of those older guys like Lane Johnson can help out. But, um, I, I mean, I don't know. They, they might find somebody that's maybe, maybe older, but I hope not. I, I want to start fresh with offense. Right. Who, so there were obviously a lot of free agency moves this year before we even started uh, thinking about the draft. What 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 do you guys think was the biggest loss? Like there there were a lot of moves made, a lot of guys left, signed deals. But um, is there any former Eagle player from 2019 that you that you think is like a not devastating, but um, just kind of sad to see him go? Because for me, I think about Jordan Howard, how how good of a season he had in, in a somewhat small sample size. Um, but that 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 so-called stinger that he had with his with his shoulder was just uh, that was devastating in and of itself. But any anything that stands out to you guys? I mean, definitely Malcolm Jenkins. I mean, I think that there was locker room problems with that, and you know, I think he was a bit of a drama queen. Um, but I mean, like he was our guy. You know, I I I don't know. I don't I don't want to say I was surprised about it, but I was a little upset. And I think we're going to be missing him next year, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with both of you. To me, Jordan Howard continues to be the most undervalued running back in the league. That guy puts up insane numbers, and, he, he, you know, he's just not valued the way that other top running backs are. So, so that was a big loss to me. But on the other hand, you know, Miles Sanders is looking like the future. And the way that running backs are coming out of college now, you really don't need to give one a monster contract, a Christian McCaffrey contract um, to get a good, decent running back for at least five, four or five years. Yeah, that's fair. I, I mean, he, McCaffrey signed a, a, a humongous contract a couple of days ago, didn't he? Like yes. Four years, uh, four years, $64 million for a, for a running back. Yeah. Which, I mean, he's a special running back. He's, right, you know, right. basically their entire offense at this point. But still. <laughs> it's a lot of money. It and, is. And, and it's not like we're going to – I mean, do we even – are we even paying anybody that kind of money right now? Wentz. Well, uh, right, okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, a guy that, that we obviously didn't lose, but a guy that I really wish we had gotten was Stefan Diggs. I know that he's had some kind of concerns the last couple of years, but I think he would have been absolutely fun to watch in our offense, um, especially, you know, with Deshaun Jackson, you know, towards the tail end of his career. Stefan Diggs is still young enough that I think he would have made a meaningful impact the next few years. Yeah, and I mean, similar to that, I mean, DeAndre Hopkins, I don't even feel like they were trying for him. I mean, which was like, you know, as soon as they say that, we're like, oh, my God, why not? Let's go. But that sucks. <laughs> Do you think we had? Do you think we actually had a legit shot at getting Hopkins? I mean, I, they 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 gave nothing for him. I mean, <laughs> any we could have easily given that up, but I don't think you even make that call expecting it to work. You know, it's just like so outlandish that you don't even expect it to work. So why even bother to make the call? Especially when they traded, basically, you know, they traded for Brandon Cooks too. I don't see how he is an upgrade over DeAndre Hopkins. Oh no, not at all. I mean. The fact I think what what made that trade so biz, bizarre. I mean, the fact that Hopkins is the best receiver in football is that at points that there were points in times last year where David Johnson looked like he aged ten years in a matter of a couple months, or he forgot how to run the football efficiently. I've had him on my fantasy team the last three years. I don't even want to talk about David Johnson. I really don't. I, and that was that. That's what. That's what made the. That's what made the trade so wild, but I mean, free eight. I mean, that's just you're right, Tyler. It is what it is with that because I don't think like how he would how how his reputation would take a would take a plunder if uh, if he did that. 
So for the uh, the MLB, the uh, the new realignment, uh, uh, you know, possibility there, uh, we we see the the Phillies would be in the same division as the Yankees, Toronto, Detroit, and Pittsburgh. What are your thoughts on you know playing baseball that way? I know that you know they've kind of talked about a potential realignment, especially next time they expand because. You know, the travel burden is hard in the playoffs. The NBA is set up and the NHL are set up in a way that, you know, it, it eases the travel burden because you're, you're playing only on your side of the country. Um, so do you think if, if they do this and it works out, um, you know, they're, they're still maintaining some rivalries. Philly doesn't happen to be in, in the same division as any of their old division rivals. But I think a Phillies-Yankees rivalry would certainly develop very quickly if this was just, you know, a couple of years. Um, do you think that if this goes well, do you see anything like this in the future? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's just not, it's not ideal. I, I mean, it's, you know, get baseball backing up, do whatever you can to do that. Cause I want to watch everybody wants to play. Let, let's do it. But I just, I don't want them to rush into things. I just, I just feel like everything has to happen really quickly right now because the season already started and they're trying to figure out what to do but I, I would rather them like just postpone it and say like let's not even start until June anything but um like I, I just understand that the season has to go longer than after that I mean I guess it doesn't I don't know is that is that what the plan is saying that it would go regular amount of time I've, I've seen reports that there could be playoffs in November if, if this were to go through um but that's also uh, that's also if uh, if things work out and and conditions health conditions improve too. So it's like um, How do you the the, un the uncertainty factor again is so overwhelming and and controlling of the situation that um, that Rob Manfred said himself that these are only ideas and and uh, um, they you can't even call them plans because of how uh, how constantly things are. Yeah, and I mean, like, Mike Trout was saying that, like, he he doesn't really like the uncertainty factor either, because, like, how is he supposed to, like, he's waiting for the birth of his first child. How is he supposed to, like, leave and watch his child be born and then come back? What, does he have to be quarantined for two weeks? Like, how does that work? You know yeah. what I mean? And I mean, I was saying earlier to you guys that I would rather it just be played in Florida, in Arizona, and, like, kind of in their spring training facilities so that... Um, the guys at least have houses there. And if they did want to um, stay with their families, then they could do that because it's just, it's like the robots. If they're just going from the hotel to the field back, back and forth, back and forth, not seeing anybody that's in their family. I think it's just unrealistic to me. But uh, I guess as, as far as the, like the future of the MLB goes, you know, they're, they're talking about obviously expanding with the NHL, adding two new teams, Las Vegas and eventually Seattle everyone knows that the leagues are all going to be at 32 teams at some point. Do you, if they do try this realignment and, and you know, really solid uh, games are played between these, these teams in different divisions that they are not used to, if, you know, exciting baseball is played, do you see that as obviously when this is all over um, and they do expand or even before they expand, just to ease the travel burden, do you think that you can ever possibly see them doing away with the National and American League? I don't know. I, it's, so it's would so the hard. I feel like baseball fans are so, like, don't change anything. You know what I mean? Um, keep it the old way. And, and I'm kind of like that. I'm, I'm pretty biased. Um, and I think it's a biased way to look at it because, you know, with the change of the rules this season and, you know, just things that are changing. Um, I, I don't want it to be like that, but I guess I probably should look and see a new perspective. But I think that it's one of those things that we have to wait and see and how competitive these games are and how exciting they are. Um, I know the MLB is looking to get more of a fan base because people don't watch baseball because it's slow. Right. I, I mean, I think, I think, gee, you made a good point uh, a little bit ago that, whatever they have to do to make it work fine as long as it's temporary and not and not a permanent change if they want to do this the, these two different leagues you know the grapefruit and uh forget what the other league name is but cactus um, cactus if, if they want to do that then what then that's fine but 
like I, I, I am with Gia where they baseball fans in general are going to have a problem if that stays. If they have to do it because of the because of the pandemic and you know the way things are altered, then that's fine. Then so be it. But like we definitely don't want to see it stay like that. We want things to go back to normal once things in general with 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 the health crisis go back to normal. They're also talking about, you know, if, if they if they do start in June, but they want to maintain that 162 game schedule, which I don't know how they would possibly do that, but they would have a lot of double headers. Um, and to ease the burden of e- extra innings, they would have home du- home run derbies, uh, which a lot of players have called for. Um, and and that was being called for before the pandemic started. Um, what are your thoughts on that? It would be pretty cool. I think it would. I think it would be. Uh, it would. It almost reminds me of like how hockey and and soccer do like do shootouts and and penalty kicks for to, to decide games and in like later in the, at the end of regulation or at the end of overtime. Like, um, it would be it would be MLB's own version of overtime. I feel like it would be like an entertain an entertaining sort of way to do it. It's a different way of thinking about it, so I I, I definitely appreciate the creativity. Um, but like, but, isn't like sitting and watching a game for three more hours than you thought? Isn't that just like, don't you just love that? Because I do. I, I mean, genuinely do. Really? <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I, I don't know. I just feel like that's like a cheat out. You know what I mean? I don't. I don't like it. And like, my high school, they they had this you know this shootout rule in soccer, and um they went to the state championships and they did a, a shootout cause they went into overtime and they did this, um, they didn't do a second shootout because, um, they tied. So they just both won the state championship. So I feel what? like that something like that will happen and that's not what I want. So. Yeah. yeah. So me, me and G are baseball purists. It sounds like. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry everybody, but it's, the game's not <laughs> slow. So keep watching baseball. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, we are now at a point where we are longer than a typical Sports Talk Philadelphia show. So do you want to wrap up, Josh? <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, that's going to do it for the the debut of the online version of Sports Talk Philly. Um, yeah, ca- yeah, catch us on social media. Uh, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll be posting this on Twitter. Um, and hopefully we'll, we can get this over to Tanya. She can put it up on YouTube if possible. Um, but yeah, we hope everybody's staying safe and socially distancing, and we'll be back to normal at some point. Because uh, we so sure think... are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's that's uh, that's gonna do it.